Well, praise the Lord, everyone. This is Mass Memorial CME Sunday School for May 28, 2023, and this is Sister Sharon. We are on the last lesson of our spring quarter, Jesus Calls Us, Unit 3, The Birth of the Church. This is the fifth of five lessons in the book of Acts. Today's lesson, The Challenges of Change. Our key verse, Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou might receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. That's Acts 9, 17. Our lesson scripture today is Acts 9, 9 through 17, but I'm going to go to 18. And talk a little bit further than that. Amen. So let's look at our background. We've been in the book of Acts. So this is just abbreviated part of this. And it says um, Acts or Acts of the Apostles or Acts of the Holy Spirit or the Acts of the Church. And then the author is Luke, the beloved physician, who's also a historian. And so now today we're going to talk about Saul. And his Hebrew name was Saul possibly named after Israel's first king. His Roman name was Paul. Now in this lesson, we're not gonna, he's not gonna ever be called Paul. He's gonna be called Saul for the entire lesson. He was Jewish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was born a Roman citizen. He was born at Tarsus in Cilicia, which is a location in current Turkey. He was a tent maker by trade. He was a Pharisee and a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Before his conversion, he consented to the death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And we're going to look at that a little bit in our background. And before his, his conversion, he was a persecutor of Christians. And we'll look at that. And then he had the Damascus Road experience. And we'll also look at that. We're going to look at that in our background so that we'll be ready for our lesson. And then I put to be continued because our lesson comes in before the continuation of um. Paul's life or Saul's life. So today's lesson comes from Damascus. And so I wanted to show you um, the location of Damascus. And so you'll see it at the top of the map. And, and so then with that, these are the cities in the Decapolis. So Damascus was part of the Decapolis, which was a league of 10 cities. There was Kanatha, Damascus, Dion, Gadara. We talked about um, Gadara before. Garasa, modern day Jordan, Hippos, Pella, Philadelphia, Rafana, and Scythopolis. So if you look at our map again, you see that those cities are um, written in black. So you see Damascus is actually the far north. And then um, you see the other cities that were part of what was called the Decapolis. And also I want you to notice the location of Jerusalem, which is to the south um, west the southwest, um, where you see Judea, you'll see the city of Jerusalem. So just so you have those locations. But today we're talking mainly from Damascus, which was part of the Decapolis. So we need to do some background scripture so we know where things, and I could just tell you, but I'm going to actually show you in the scripture where it is. So we're doing some scripture from Acts 7, 58, part B through 60, um, Acts 8, verses 1 and 3, and then Acts 9, 1 through 8. And I'll just talk about that. I named the first part spiritually blind. And it says, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And this is the same Saul we'll be talking about today. And notice that he says, it says he's a young man. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So Stephen was the first Christian martyr. And he had just got done doing this great testimony about Jesus Christ, um, and also just talking about how he was crucified, you know, and so he just did this great testimony and they got upset, you know, and um, they stoned Stephen to death. OK, so and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord, Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And I love that part. So that's why I put that, because it just says he didn't charge of the people who killed him. He said, Lord, don't put this on their account. So this wasn't put on Saul's account, even. even he was a witness to this. He laid his clothes, the, um, the clothes of the people who were stoning him were at his feet, at Saul's feet. But 
Stephen said, do not lay this sin against them. And then he fell asleep, you know, um, that sleep in Jesus. And so this is where we first see Saul consenting to the death of Stephen. Now it says in chapter eight, now Saul was consenting to his death. Okay. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. That's why I showed you Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And then jumping to verse three, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So Saul was consenting to Stephen's death. And then he was also um, a persecutor of the church. This is what we see here. And notice again, you notice the people scattered through Judea and Samaria. And remember Acts 1.8 said that the gospel was going to spread. It was going to go from um, Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to, to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And so we see this even with the um, disciples being scattered, that the gospel was still being spread. But Saul was persecuting the church. So then we go to chapter nine, the beginning before we get to our lesson. It says, then Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, okay? Went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, and that's what Christianity was called, it was called the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he was still breathing threats. He was and talking murder and dragging, um, causing havoc in the church and dragging men and women to go to prison. But now he was headed to Damascus. So part of the Decapolis to do the same thing. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Okay. And he said, who are you, Lord? And I highlighted Lord because, okay, this is what I call the Damascus Road experience, or the idea is that Saul got knocked off of his donkey, and he, or, he, or he fell to the ground because this suddenly bright light shone around him from heaven. And he said, who are you, Lord? So he realized even before he asked, this was Lord for this experience to happen. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus. And I, I highlighted that because Saul needed to know that Jesus was the son of God. Saul needed to know that Jesus Christ was Lord. And so Jesus was specific in saying, I am Jesus. So it says, then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goals. So in other words, you're going against me. You know, you're going against me. Okay. And, and it's like, and it's not going to be good for you to keep going against me. So he, this is Saul, trembling and astonished. Okay, so he's on the ground. He's trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? So now that he realizes again, this I am Jesus, he still calls him Lord. Because remember, he was on his way to, he was, he was dragging Christians into, dragging Christians out of churches and dragging them to prison. Or, you know, and so out of the synagogues in that time, you know what I mean? Um, but if they, they believe in the way, he was putting them in prison, whether they were men, whether they were women. You know, he was threatening. He was murderous. And so now all of a sudden he's not, he fell down. This bright light shone. He fell down. He said, Lord, who are you? The Lord says, I am Jesus. And you're persecuting whom you're persecuting. That's what you're doing. You're persecuting my church. And then trembling, Saul says, Lord, what do you want me to do? So even after he says, I am Jesus, he realizes Jesus is Lord. Amen. Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless. So now I call this part physically blind because this is what happened. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground. And when his eyes were open, because he had fell on the ground, he had his eyes shut. When he opened his eyes, he saw no one, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. So there you see the relationship, Jerusalem, that's where he was. He wanted to go to persecute the um, God's church, the way in Damascus. And along the way, um, Jesus interrupted that, that whole scene and let him know, you're persecuting me and you need to stop that. And then 
Um, when he rose, he was also physically blind at this time. This gets into our lesson. So our lesson is Acts 9, 9 through 18. So it says, and he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. So this is Saul. So first of all, I capitalized three, three days of fasting and prayer. You'll see later on in the in our scripture that it says he was praying as well. So here it just says he neither ate nor drank. Well, whether this was a spiritual fast where we purposely don't eat, or this has been a traumatic experience, whether it's just a traumatic experience and he didn't feel like eating or drinking, and that has happened, um, happened to me. Like I said, when um, sometimes when someone passes away, I don't feel like eating. Or if something serious happens, I don't feel like eating. But whatever it was, it, he was three days, he didn't have sight. And he was three days not eating or drinking. And we know the number three is a number of completion um, with God. Okay. So we think about um, the triune God, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit. We think of other things that happened in threes on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. Okay. And so with that in mind, three is a number of completion. And so Saul was three days without sight and he didn't eat and he didn't drink. Then now this next part I call Ananias, just an ordinary person. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And by the way, Damascus is in current day Syria. So, you know, okay. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. Now, the first thing I want to point out about this scripture is, um, I got this from um, the commentary on the towns and press. And it says, it is interesting to note that Ananias was not identified with prominence. He was simply identified as a certain disciple, an average follower of Jesus. Ananias is presented as an ordinary man, not an apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, elder, or deacon. I can add to that list steward, okay, treasurer, he wasn't, he was just identified as a certain disciple. Disciple means follower in our terms of Christianity, follower of Jesus Christ. Yet God used him in a mighty way. And we're going to see that God using Ananias in a mighty way. But again, he was a certain disciple. And I just want to make sure we understand that God uses ordinary people. He, we, we don't have to have a big title. OK, we don't have to have a big office. OK, if we are a follower of Jesus Christ, then there's a mission for us. There's a ministry for us. And so God can use us in a mighty way. And there's a song by Danny Bell Hall. It's an older um, gospel song. And this is the first verse of it or the chorus of it. And it goes, just ordinary people. God uses ordinary people. He chooses people just like me and you who are willing to do what he commands. God uses people that will give him all. No matter how small your all may seem to you because little becomes much as you place it in the master's hand. And so here, Ananias was an ordinary person that God was about to use in a mighty way because he was placing his life in the master's hand. Now, the other thing we notice from that scripture, it says that Ananias had a vision. And there's six ways people are addressed by God. And I found this from Dallas, from Dallas Willard's book, Hearing God. And one way is a phenomenon and a voice. So for an example, that would be Moses with the burning bush, a phenomenon, the bush was burning, but it wasn't burning up. And then a voice coming out of the bush. A second way is a supernatural messenger or an angel. So we see in the Bible how um, angel Gabriel was sent on many occasions. We also, the third way, which is in today's lesson, dreams and visions. So um, the word says that, um, um, uh, young men will see visions and old men will dream dreams. You know, that says well, it'll come to that, that point. Um, and so it's the idea that dreams and visions. Then there's also an audible voice, okay? 
Then the fifth way is the human voice. And what they mean by what Dallas Willard means by the human voice is God using a person to speak to you. So when Nathan spoke to King David about his sin, um, that's an example of a human voice. It was a message um, for David from God through Nathan. And then we see when Elijah um, was looking for God and it wasn't in the fire and it wasn't in, he wasn't in the earthquake, but he was in the still small voice of God. So that's six ways people are addressed by God. Okay. Or we might say it's um, that still small voice with like, like the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Okay. The prompting of the Holy Spirit. So that's how we're addressed by God. So here Ananias had a vision. And when he had that vision, and we're going to just go back, you know, um, heard something, he wouldn't heard, saw something he normally wouldn't see. Um, again, he heard the Lord say in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. Now, the other thing is notice that Ananias knew that this was God talking to him. Okay. He knew that this was the Lord talking to him or Jesus talking to him. And so in John 10, 14 to 27, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So here Ananias, he heard Jesus. And he said, um, here I am, Lord. Okay, here I am, Lord. So he knew the voice of the good shepherd. He knew the voice of his Lord, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So then here's the next part, and I call it go. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. See, remember I told you he was praying and fasting. He wasn't eating, he wasn't drinking. But we see that here that he's also praying. And in a vision, and so Saul had a vision as well. Okay, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in. So in his vision, you know, he's seen, okay, a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. So this is what Saul saw in the vision. So he... He, Jesus is telling Ananias, you need to go, arise and go to the street called Straight. Now the street called Straight still exists today. They put some other names on it, but just so you know a little bit about this street, it says the Damascus Straight Street referred to in the conversion of St. Paul in Acts 9-11, also known as the Via Recta, was the Decuminus, the east-west main street of Roman Damascus and extended for over 1,500 meters, and you know, for us non-meter talking people, 4,900 feet. Just so you know, a mile is 5,280 feet. So this was just short of a mile, but that's how long the street is and the street called Straight. Damascus is still in existence. It might be called by other names a little bit, but it's still Damascus in Syria. In Syria. And it is still, the street called Straight is still there. And actually there are two different churches on that street now two different Orthodox churches on that street or the headquarters of two Orthodox churches on that street. So again, the Lord was very specific, okay? He was very specific with Ananias. He said, arise, so he, I need you to get up and I need you to go. You need to go to the street called Straight. You need to go to the house of Judas because his house was on that street, okay? And you, you're looking for Saul of Tarsus, okay? Uh, for he's praying. And he's going to, he has seen in a vision, you coming, and you're going to put your hands on him, okay, lay hands on him, you know, and after you that do that, you know, because the power of the Holy Spirit or the power of God, you know, then he's going to receive his sight. So very specific, you know, and God telling him to go, told him his ministry, told him his mission. And so then Ananias goes, God, did you hear? You know, so Ananias goes, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So in other words, God, I'm not sure if you heard, <laughs> I'm not sure if you know, but this isn't the best man for me to go see. And definitely not to go and mention your name, because if I mention your name, he has the authority to bind me and imprison me. You know, he said, so it's like, Lord, he says, Lord, I have heard, but it's just idea that, okay, I've heard this. This isn't good. 
he did a lot of harm to the church, the saints, those other Christians, did a lot of harm to the Christians in Jerusalem. He's here to do harm to the Christians here. And you want me to go and lay hands on him? You know, so God did, did is like, I'm like, God, did, did you hear what I heard, you know, um, about this man? And then there's another go. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, okay? Because remember, still in Acts, we're going from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now to the ends of the earth. That gets into Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, okay? But it says, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So not only are you giving him, you're going to see him, then you're going to lay hands on him. He's going to receive his sight. And down the line, Saul's going to find out that he's a chosen vessel for God, for Jesus, okay? And that he's going to suffer for, for the sake of, sake of Christ. He's going to suffer. So from these scriptures, from 13 through 16, first we want to, I want to mention about fear not because Ananias is fearful. And Joshua, now God gave him a mission, but Ananias is fearful because he heard, you know, he heard stuff. And that's the, that's a fact, you know, and we need to talk about that sometimes. Sometimes there's, fa there's facts, but then there's also truth. Okay. And so the fact is Saul was sent with papers to bind up Christians and put them in prison. That's a fact. The truth is, God has chosen Saul. The other thing is we need to look at in these scriptures is that because of what Ananias heard, he was fearful. But God is telling them, you go, go in faith. I've got you. And so with fear not, Joshua 1, 9 says, have I not commanded you? Remember, God commanded um, Ananias to go. Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So if God sends us somewhere, he's with us. God, and we also know it says in God's word, God will never leave us nor forsake us, okay? And so he goes before us, he goes with us and he's after us. Remember, he's omnipresent, he's everywhere. Then 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so these are things that Ananias needed to know that um, God had commanded him. God was going with him. He needed to be strong and of good courage. He need not be afraid nor dismayed for God was going to be with him and that God didn't give him a spirit of fear. Then the next thing is we see in the scripture that God, the Jesus tells, and I know I'm going back and forth between God and Jesus, because here in the lesson is more so like said, when they say, Lord, they're talking about Jesus Christ, because that is who Saul needs to understand. He needs to understand that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So then it says, go for he is a chosen vessel of mine. So we want to talk about chosen. And there is a series out right now, and I haven't seen it. My God sister loves it called The Chosen, um, which tells the story of Jesus from the different disciples' points of view, okay? And it's called The Chosen. And, but John 15, 16 tells us, and this is Jesus talking. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. And he's talking to his disciples he's, and, and we're his disciples. And he says, you did not choose me. He says, but I chose you. And he's appointed us, okay, to go and bear much fruit. And so the same thing he's saying to um, Ananias, he said, um, I chose you to go. He said, but I'm also choosing Saul to go and bear fruit. He's a chosen vessel, okay? So we're the chosen and then we're talking about the word vessels. And this is um, Saul, who we also call Paul. 
him actually writing this in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 11. And Paul says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. Okay, so we're chosen vessels. Now, that doesn't mean that the vessels aren't going to go through, okay, that they're just going to sit on a shelf and, and be pretty, okay. This tells us, okay, we're earthen vessels. First of all, that means it's, it, it's, it's not our power. Even with Ananias, what he's getting ready to do when he, lay hand, when he lays hands on Saul, he's an earthen vessel. The power is the power of the Holy Spirit. The power is the power of God so that Saul receives his sight. So we're, so this treasure that we have in us, okay, is the power of God. And it says we are, because we're earthen vessel, we are hard pressed on every side. This is verse eight, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted. Okay, remember all the people in Jerusalem who were persecuted, the people, you know, and we see persecution still today of Christians in different ways, um, some physical, some um just going against um, what we believe. Um, some in politics, we, we see some in the way the world is going, okay? But it says, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always caring about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So we are vessels as well. We are chosen, chosen earthen vessels filled with the power of God. The, the, that power is not of us, it's of God. So we go through, so notice as a chosen vessel, we go through just like 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 11 says, because we're caring about that life of Jesus, okay? With just like Paul, not just like us, Paul went through so much more probably, and we're going to talk about that. But the idea is that we, you, can, you will suffer for the cause of Christ Jesus in some way, okay? Um, you know, and the word says it, amen? So then... Jesus had talked to Ananias, told him, you need to go. I've chosen Saul as a, um, he's a chosen vessel of mine and he needs, you're going to lay hands on him. So he'll receive sight because I've chosen him. And I also need to tell him about the suffering he's going to do for my name's sake. So then I call this a charge to keep. I have because then Ananias, after Jesus explained that the Lord explained this to him and I went his way and entered the house. So and then I went his way. He went to the street called Straight. He went to Judas's house and laying his hands on Saul, on him, he said, Brother Saul. I highlighted brother because that means that Ananias accepted what the Lord said to him, that he was going to be part of the way. He was going to be a Christian. And so Ananias has accepted that this man is a chosen vessel for the Lord. And so Ananias goes and says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus. And I highlighted and put in red the Lord Jesus because he Ananias was specific, okay? Because they believed in God, okay? But they did not believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God. And so Ananias was specific saying, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, you know, and even the fact that he knew that, you know, it's not that Saul went and told him that. He said, who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and that's where our lesson actually ends, everyone. But I went ahead and put verse 18. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. This fell out of Saul's eyes and he received his sight at once and he arose and he was baptized. So he got his physical sight back, but then he also received spiritual sight. He received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And then the baptism is an outward show 
of an inward change. That's actually where our lesson ends. But it was a challenge. Remember, the lesson was about a challenge. It was a challenge because Ananias was challenged to go to Saul, okay, who he felt, who, who he knew was a persecutor of church, believing God that God said, no, he's a chosen vessel. And sometimes we, um, and I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself on this, you know, but just the idea that he accepted the challenge because he believed God and he had faith in God and he trusted God and he obeyed God. And then I call this just to end our lesson. And Paul lived Christfully ever after. A lot of times at the end of a story, they say happily ever after. And sometimes happily depends on your happenings. But I wanted to say that Paul lived Christfully ever after. Okay, this is the part of the to be continued that I told you about. He was he became an apostle to the Gentiles. He was a defender and an advocate of the Christian faith. He was the writer of 13 letters or epistles presented in the New Testament. He went on three great missionary journeys. He spent two years in house arrest in Rome, and he believed to have been beheaded in 67 AD during Nero's reign. Remember, Jesus said that he was a chosen vessel and that he would suffer for Jesus' sake. And I want to even show you that in 2 Corinthians, which is one of the letters that um, Paul or Saul wrote, okay? It says in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 27, and he's talking about himself. This is Saul talking. He says, from the Jews five times, I received 40 stripes minus one. So he was beat 39 times with, with a whip, Okay, just one less because 40 might kill you. So they said, we can do 39. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in a deep. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen. If you read the end of Acts 9, you'll see that they had to get him out of the city um, after a few days. Okay, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleepness, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. He says, I've been through all this. He was a chosen vessel for the cause of Christ Jesus, but he also suffered for the cause of Christ Jesus. But Paul lived Christfully ever after. And one way we know that is he even said in Philippians 1.21, another letter that he wrote, for me to live is Christ, Christfully, and to die is gain. And I pray that we can say that, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then to summarize this lesson, because this lesson, even though it talked about Saul's experience, this lesson really was a lot about Ananias. And there's other Ananias in the Bible, but they're not the same one. We never hear Ananias' name again in the Bible. So we there's another Ananias, there's two more, but they're not the same ones. But this Ananias that we see in Acts 9, okay, we need to be an Ananias like in Acts 9. It says in Word and Life in the Word and Life Study Bible, you may not be called to a prominent work as Saul was, but you can do the job God has called you to do. And if you look, you know, sometimes we look at, and even with me, I might look um, on YouTube, I might look on Facebook to see how many people listen to the lesson. And you might say, oh, that many. And then you'll see others where they have, um, um, triple or quadruple or millions and so forth. But I'm called to do the job that God has called me to do. Okay. And sometimes you don't know who you're affecting. Ananias, we never hear from that certain disciple again, but he was there for Saul. And then Saul wrote 13 epistles of the New Testament. And Saul, Saul, Paul, okay, was a mighty man of God, you know, that we see all through the New Testament. So again, 
We see Ananias once, but what he did helped spread the gospel because he went to the chosen vessel, Saul, because he was obedient to God. And we see that with other people. We might mention Billy Graham, okay? All the crusades he did, but who led Billy Graham to Christ? One person, right? Um, there's a, he's deceased now, Robbie Zacharias, a uh, defender of the Christian faith, okay? Who was not, he did not grow up in Christianity, okay? Um, he was, he grew up in Hinduism, okay? But who led Robbie Zacharias to Christ? One person, I'll put that one here, one person. So again, we need to be an Ananias. We need to be an Ananias. And then just finally ending this, just like Ananias, we have to be mindful. Who have you discounted or counted as no account that God has chosen? Because Ananias was like, it can't be Saul of Tarsus. He's killing, he's killing the saints. So we need to think about, is there anybody you've discounted or anybody I've discounted? And I can say yes, unfortunately. Um, anybody that we counted as no account, you know how they say that person's of no account? That God has chosen. That God has chosen. And that means that we need to pray for those people, even if they're in our political system. And we feel like they'll never be saved. That's not our decision. God might have chose, God chooses. We need to pray for them. And if God sends us to talk to that one, we need to go. We need to be able, when we hear God, we need to hear God. And then we need to do just like Ananias, here I am, Lord. And you'll see that all through the Bible. Um, Samuel, here I am, Lord. You hear different people saying, here I am, Lord. We need to say, here I am, Lord. And then when Jesus tells us to go, we need to go. And we can't discount or count as no account someone that God has chosen. There are so many chosen vessels yet, still, that have not accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And we need to pray for them. And we need to tell them about Jesus when we're led to tell them about Jesus. This is our lesson for this week, being an Ananias. And if God has so chosen you, be that converted Saul. We give you, we just give God praise. Be blessed, love in Christ, Sister Sharon.